wet and cold. Time for the door, eh? Yeah. I'll make the uh, vent hole for up. Smooth it off, isn't it? Well, we've virtually completed the snow cave now. At this stage, you're already getting the benefit of the shelter because we're well out of the wind and the snow. We've created two sleeping platforms like this here, and this gap in between isn't just to help us get in and out. It's also to collect cold air. It's called a, a cold well or a cold sink. So the warmth is here, the cold sinks down, and we sleep more comfortably. One of the most important features is this, the air vent. Whenever you're in one of these uh, snow caves, snow shelters, they're virtually airtight and carbon monoxide builds up, which is toxic. So you've always got to have an air vent. And to make sure that stays clear and working, we need to be able to clean it from inside in case snow accumulates outside. Oh, top gun. A candle gives a little warmth, and a flickering flame can be a useful warning that there may not be enough oxygen. Although these shelters shrink a little every day, climbers can sit out storms in them in relative comfort for days until the weather clears and they're able to move on. But the higher you go and the faster you go up, the more at risk you are from altitude sickness. The name given to the common symptoms we all get is acute mountain sickness and it, in, in a way it's a misnomer because acute implies that it's going to come on very suddenly whereas it often develops first with a delay at altitude you go up to three and a half thousand meters you feel fine when you get there and then next day you begin to feel rotten. Generally it's a mild illness with flu-like symptoms. It only really becomes a worry because of its serious complication. Either the brain fills up with fluid, which is called cerebral edema, or the lungs fill up with, with fluid, which is called pulmonary edema. And both of these are life-threatening. One of the remarkable things about these conditions is they get better very quickly. If you can drop down even 300 meters, something like that, 1,000 feet, if people recover. 50 years ago, Climbers didn't have the benefit of all this knowledge, but medical advice is useless unless you choose to follow it. Time and time again, you'll hear of people who develop a bit of pulmonary edema or a bit of brain edema, and they say, oh, we'll sit it out on this campsite, we won't go down, and that ends in disaster, that they become either extremely breathless and then, in a matter of a few hours, moribund. Uh, or if they've got brain edema, they become unsteady, unreasonable, and all the things that you do when you're drunk. Unlike the effects of alcohol, if you're suffering from coma, from brain edema, the chances of survival are relatively slim. But usually, you either die of acute mountain sickness complications or you make a complete recovery. If you have to get out of the mountains in a hurry, one of the most useful tools is a rope with which to lower yourself down. But of course the problem is finding something to tie it to, a belay point, when everything's covered in all this snow. Well, to answer that need, surprisingly, mountaineers will often resort to the snow itself, using snow in conjunction with their ice axe to create what they call a retrievable ice axe belay. First thing I'm going to do is stamp down this soft snow because that has no strength in it at all. The next thing I need to start to create a groove here in the stronger layers of snow a little lower down. Be careful not to break its structure too much. I'm going to use two ice axes for this belay. Now here's the science bit. You need to join them together and anchor them in the snow in a T-shape. 
The rope is looped around them in such a way that to pull on one side releases the upright axe, pulling the other out with it. I have to be careful to maintain an even load on each half of the rope on my way down. The last thing I want to happen is for the belay to pull out halfway down the slope. But there we go, I'm down safely and I've still got my ice axes. Now if this was a big slope, I might have to repeat the whole process two or three times to get down. This technique's relatively simple in good conditions, but lenticular clouds like these mean changing weather, and in the mountains that can happen in minutes, catching you off your guard. Which is what happened to Mike Couillard, an American Air Force pilot, and his son Matt when they decided to tackle the highest run on a skiing trip in Turkey. He didn't know it then, but he was about to rely on his limited survival training. I was there on assignment with the Air Force for two years, and we were on a recreational ski trip in one of the uh, few areas, really, in Turkey where you could go skiing. As we rode the lift up, snow was starting to fall, and I remember as we got off the lift, it was even heavier. It was just all of a sudden, you know, the snow started falling pretty heavy, and it got harder and harder to see very far. Before long, they couldn't see more than a few feet, but despite that, they pressed on, breaking one of the most important rules of survival. Stop. Don't move. I knew, I'm sure in the back of my mind, that uh, I'm complicating any search effort. I think what drove me to that is I never planned to be the recipient of a search effort. I really thought we we're going to find our way off that mountain on our own that first night. They'd set off down the wrong side of the mountain, so instead of heading back towards safety, they were, in fact, heading further away from it. Now, they could have stopped and tried to retrace their tracks, but as so often happens in these situations, people go into a state of denial and head on regardless into the unknown. It's something I'm sure we've all experienced at one time or other. But Mike was convinced he was going in the right direction. For a 10-year-old, I think I pushed him pretty hard. He would fall in the snow from time to time. And I think sometimes he admitted later he fell in the snow just, to, just so I would stop and, and let him get a breath. Of course, I knew that we were fighting a battle of time. I wasn't worried until we stopped, and I knew we were going to spend the night on that mountain. And I think it was then that the full weight of the situation hit me. My son by now is shivering cold. He's, his clothes are all wet. so. I wanted something I could set up within about 30 minutes. And they taught us in survival school how to make shelters with existing things like a tree with wide open branches, and that's what I picked. He'd been taught that you lose a lot of heat by conduction from your body to the ground, which is quite right. So in their shelter, he put down a very good layer of green boughs as insulation. Absolutely the right thing to do. Despite his best efforts to make it weatherproof, they still spent a cold night under the tree. The next morning, Mike found a far better shelter, a hollow under a rock just big enough for the two of them. Had we not found that, we would have been probably a lot worse off. We would have suffered more frostbite, and more, you know, probably more verging on hypothermia. Remember, Mike and Matt had set out for a day skiing. They weren't expecting to spend nights in the mountains so they were working with hardly anything at all. All they had to deal with their hunger was five sweets, and they were already into their third day. Water was another matter. They were surrounded by snow, but they had no means of melting it. If you eat snow, you hasten the onset of hypothermia, because you're using your body's warmth to melt it, so you don't get really a great deal of return. Now, if they'd been able to light a fire, they could have used a technique like this. It's called the Finnish marshmallow. You take a block of compacted snow, prop it on a stick by the fire, so that it will drip eventually into a container. And for that, they could have simply used a ski boot. 